Melissa, welcome to the Light Path Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to get into the nitty gritty and really pick your brain all things homeopathy because it's something that I have used in the past and I think it's such a dynamic way for healing and really getting in touch with yourself and you are the best of the best I hear that we have in Australia so we cannot wait to pick your brain. Awesome. Yeah. And it's something that so many people are not familiar with. So I just love talking about all things homeopathy, just so people know what it is and how they can use it in their life. Yeah, exactly. And I love the way that you work because clearly that you really empower people to actually take it on themselves and to use it themselves with with the services that you provide. But we will get into all of that. Let's kick it off though, by kind of getting into your psyche or your personality a little bit by sharing with us your favorite quote. Okay. So my favorite quote, um, this is one, actually, I liked this um, years ago when I first read it. And it's, if you're right and you know it, speak your mind, speak your mind. Even if you are the minority of one, the truth is still the truth. And I think, you know, for me, and that was a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. And I think it's, especially in a field like mine, where it is quite new for a lot of people and it's, you know, it's a new concept. People are still learning. And yet I know that it is truth and from everything that I've experienced. So I think, you know, in this world, as things are changing, it is just good to speak your truth as you know it, as you've experienced it. And people really come alongside the truth. They know it when they hear it, like, oh, that hits. I can feel that. So yeah, that would be my favorite quote at the moment. Oh, I love that take on it because it's so true. Even though your truth might be very new as it hits people's ears or it might pull into question some of their understandings or learnings or programmings, you're Mm. so right. When it's really authentic and it comes from a place of passion and excitement and truth, then Mm. it does land differently, doesn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think we're sort of seeing this new generation, I would say right now, of people who are really grasping, like we are in um, the transition period right now of deep change, you know, things on the external look like they're crumbling and yet out of that is being born this really new way. And I think the more of us who can sort of just speak the truth as we see it, as we feel it, the quicker that evolves into sort of what we're really wanting to see for humanity. Oh, for sure. So let's dive into how you see truth in terms of health and wellness. Uh, We know your bio, we know what you've studied, but can you just really break it down for us? What is homeopathy? So homeopathic medicine, it is an energetic system of medicine. So I always tell people, a lot of people would assume that it's most like naturopathic supplements or even essential oils because it does come in the little bottles. But in fact, it is most like acupuncture. So in acupuncture, you would put in needles to stimulate the flow of energy along the meridians. With homeopathy, you're ingesting the frequency to light up the energy of your body. Now, when it comes to the actual energetics of the body. It's so interesting that homeopathy is over 200 years old. And yet now this sort of breaking, you know, science is showing that when you break down the human body into like cells, then you go into atoms, you go into like the subatomic particles, we are like this humming energy vibration and, you know, the quantum level, I'm sure, you know, you would have a lot of people familiar with this. It's um, it changes and the energy can phase in and out. So while we look at the human body as like, it's this mass, it's this material object and mainstream medicine has really treated the human body like a machine, you know, a mechanism. And when it's broken, we must fix it with like, a crude dose, a a supplement, a drug or a surgery, we need to cut it out. Whereas what we're finding more and more is that when you alter the energetic fields of the body and you change the energy of those particles of those cells, all of the building blocks, the way that the human body functions, it changes. Mm -hmm. So in my work, I use homeopathy predominantly for fertility. And when I stimulate their body energetically and I get their ovaries like really stimulated, I find that their body can almost immediately start producing the correct levels of estrogen and progesterone because we all have this energetic, what we would call in homeopathy, the vital force. In acupuncture, you call it chi, but it is this 
this force, this energetic blueprint, which from the moment of conception, like in your parents' womb, the sperm reaches the egg, you see a blast of light under the microscope. We call it the zinc spark. And it's from there that this divine energetic blueprint is able to grow a baby. So it's a very intelligent energetic force. It knows the perfect balance, how to grow eyes, how to grow a spinal cord, you know, with no conscious effort from the mother, that force knows how to create. And so this is what we're working with in homeopathy. And then you add to that, lastly, the fact that the thoughts are energy, you know, that vibration of like how we think and feel and more and more, you know, Bruce Lipton's work, the biology of belief, we're showing that the way that you think and feel, the energetics of thought that you have inherited down your family lines is what really dictates genetics. So we are not bound to the DNA and what we're susceptible to and what runs down our family because you can change the energetics through thought um, and then through homeopathy. Certainly you can really alter patterns of disease. So hope that answers it. <laughs> no biggie. There is so much in that. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, people, like you said, will be quite familiar with things, um, you know, energetic medicine that other people kind of offer other fields of thought. But ultimately it all comes down, I love that, moving to from mechanism medicine to energetic medicine and really acknowledging that our bodies are this really beautiful divine intelligence just vibrating. Mm. And if we can shift the the focus point of that vibration, then wow, the things that we can do. Mm -hmm. So, How did you get into this? I mean, I know from my experience and what I hear, it's really big in the UK and it's kind of a normal practice over there and so much so it's you know kind of government funded a lot of it but in Australia it seems to be you know a relatively new newer modality mm, yeah definitely and I was studying to be a naturopath actually so I was at a college of natural medicine and even though I was two years into my degree there and I loved you know holistic medicine I had never heard of it never heard of it oh and really I wow no. And um, I had this lecturer for human biology and anatomy or something like that. And um, he used to say to me all the time, you know, oh, you'd be a good homeopath. You'd love it. And when he used to say that to me, uh, my thought was never heard of it. Um, can't be any good if I've never heard of it. Not interested. And I always used to fob him off. And then it wasn't until I was, uh, yeah, two years in and my sister, who's 12 months younger than me, she had been chronically sick. So she'd been in and out of hospital for about six years at this point. She would get very bad urinary tract infections, which would go to the blood. She would be in hospital every time, IV antibiotics. And she was a real mystery, you know, she, so our dad is a medical doctor. So she had. Oh, had, really? So your yeah. dad's an MD. Okay. Know, funny. Everyone always asks me, oh, how does that go? I know. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm dying to know that. <laughs> um, and so he had had the best specialists for her regarding her condition. We had tried all. So my mum's a bit of a hippie. My dad's a doctor. So like I would say I come somewhere in the middle. I love to learn like science, um, disease, all of that. And yet I'm much more holistic minded. And so is mum. So we had had the naturopaths, the nutrition, the acupuncture. She had she couldn't work a job at this point because her bladder was incontinent. So she was trying everything right on both sides. And then one day at uni, this lecturer says it to me again, you know, oh, homeopathy, la, la, la. And I said, right, that's it. And I said, if you can cure my sister's chronic condition, I'll change my degree next week. And um, he said, right, well, when can she meet with me? So I brought her in and we met at Gloria Jean's the next week. He took her case. He took 90 minutes and he was really asking everything about her, her health history, her mental, emotional history, um, what was triggering the UTIs for her. It was any time that she would have sex, she would get it. Anyway, long story short, he gave her these drops to take under the tongue. And you can imagine me at this point thinking like, okay, like, you know, as if this is going to work. And um, 
but within a couple of days of taking those drops under the tongue, she started having all of these discharges, like coming out of the body um, and a lot of mental, emotional, sort of like purging, like feeling really unsettled. Um, but she was so excited because she had been bladder incontinent. She needed to go to the toilet every 20 minutes. So to peep, you know, need to go every 20 minutes. So even like going for a drive, like a 30 minute drive, like was pretty anxiety inducing because it was just a lot. And I remember on maybe the second or third day of treatment of taking these drops under the tongue, she came in and she said, oh my gosh, you won't believe this. I just went for a two hour walk and I didn't need to go to the toilet once. And I was like, whoa, you know, it's like for her, it was massive. And so fast forward and it really just got rid of that susceptibility for her. So, you know, not going back into hospital routinely, um, at that point, the doctors had told her, one, you need to abstain from having sex in general, and two, you need to be on prophylactic antibiotics every day, pretty much, in, you know, infinitely, so indefinitely rather, so that, you know, everyone knows how that would sort of wreak havoc on the body. So she went from that, thinking that she'd probably never have a husband or kids, to having this whole condition recalibrated, her body strengthened. So she stayed on those drops for about six months to a year. Um, but yeah, has two kids married, healthy, happy. And so that then when I saw that response, I was, I was shocked. And I thought, how could these drops under the tongue have caused like such a change? So before I changed my degree, I then said, right, well, now I'm going to come to you as a patient and I'm going to see if that was possibly just a placebo effect or what has happened. And anyway, I started to research. And like you said, in the UK, it's quite big. Um, and people don't realize, and I never realized that only 100 years ago in the US, we had over 100 hospitals designated to homeopathy. So they were homeopathic hospitals. And, and that was all that they practiced, homeopathy, big, massive hospitals, plenty of wards, uh, plenty of people working them. We had over a thousand homeopathic pharmacies. And this was just prior to really the pharmaceutical industry really taking over. And so when we look at the the essence of that, it was J.D. Rockefeller was sort of the figurehead of that. He had his own homeopaths for his family. So here is the richest man in the world. He has three homeopaths that look after the Rockefeller family and they're the just private physicians. And even J.D. Rockefeller initially, he said homeopathics, like quoting, homeopathy is a progressive and aggressive, uh, progressive and aggressive step in medicine. So he was very much for homeopathy. Then when he realized that he could make petrochemical drugs that could uh, be used in the body, he put a lot of funding towards all of the medical schools that would, you know, promote pharmaceutical medicine. And then when he's donating millions, it sort of comes with this condition of, but we need you to stop teaching homeopathy at Yale. We need you to stop teaching homeopathy at all of these prestigious universities. And it then became... If you want to be a homeopath, you cannot also practice medicine. So most of the homeopaths back then were also doctors. And it was very interesting because the founder of homeopathy was a medical doctor, absolutely brilliant man who realized, whoa, we can stimulate the body in this way energetically and it is more effective. Then it started to spread amongst the doctors. So a lot of people either jumped, shipped entirely well, they wanted to practice both because this was also when antibiotics were coming out, which in that era could also be used to save lives. So both would have been beneficial, but under the Flexner report, um, under all of the sort of university regulations, it was, you cannot be both. And they actually made that a law. You cannot be both. So um, yeah, that's sort of how we got to where we are today, where someone like me could be studying at a college of natural medicine and not even know what homeopathy is, the history of homeopathy. But I would say we are currently undergoing a great resurgence where like, I am so busy. It's like not even funny because everyone is realizing, you know what, there is an energetic component to how our bodies operate. It's not just a physical uh, machine as we've been led to believe. So people are really wanting to tap into that and really heal themselves on the deepest levels. And that's where I'd say homeopathy is so effective. 
I, I really believe that in, you know, a few hundred years or whatever, when we look back on this era in history, I would be zero surprise in my body if it was called the energetic era, mm-hmm. where we turned to back to the energetic practices mm-hmm. that, you know, were held civilizations for centuries before yeah. things like monetizing of medicine came along. Mm-hmm. Was it Rockefeller who um, wrote that essay all about if we keep them kind of sick, we keep them working? Was that Rockefeller? It would have been maybe not J.D. Rockefeller. Okay. Um, there was there's another one of his sons, um, Jacob Rothschild. A lot of them. I mean, the Rothschild. Oh, it could have been Rothschild. Yeah, I know. Go- Google it out there if you're listening to this. It is scary. Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And now I didn't know that context. I didn't know the context of how big it was and mm. widely accepted it was. But I understand from the monetary perspective or the mass production perspective how it would get into that, you know, economic uh, influence as opposed to the benefit and the good of the people. Mm. And when you look at those hospitals, they were around the times of the pandemics back then would have been scarlet fever, Mm. um, these uh, Spanish flu. And when you look at the mortality rates, that came out of the homeopathic hospitals versus the allopathic sort of like mainstream hospitals. It's very clear what system of medicine back then was more effective, bearing in mind that medicine back then wasn't what it is now, but it still very much has warranted. um, Yes. uh, it, It gets a lot of attention, but you have to ask yourself, why does the queen of England have her own private homeopath? Here is one of the w- richest women in the world. Mm-hmm. So the Royal family have long been patrons of homeopathy. They donate to the, the faculty in the UK. And um, yet for people like us on this sort of normal level, it's so suppressed, you know, so homeopathy has been very famous among um, the hierarchy, the monarchies. Um, yeah. For, for a very long time, I would say. Is there, have you noticed there's even conversations around making it subsidised, you know, like kinesiology subsidised now, things like that. Is there any kind of push to that in Australia at the moment? It's, it's gone the other way. So we we used to be on private health. Um, and people could claim they could choose to use homeopathy, but it, um, in a very corrupt report, um, they were able to pull that. But it sort of it doesn't stop people, you know. These yeah, days, yeah. You just know if you want to be well, you just unfortunately got to yeah. really seek it um, yourself. And ultimately, they know that you end up in a better place where you don't have to pay as much for your medical attention yeah. if you can get it right. Um, Mm. Yeah, for sure. I would love to see in future, absolutely, because we do have a lot of people right now who are very sick and who actually can, I mean, times are tight for many people Mm. and they cannot actually afford the ongoing appointments. The thing with homeopathy is that it can take time to diagnose and figure out what do people actually need to stimulate their body to heal itself. And so it's not like a, a drug where you can read online. It's like, okay, Panadol is for exactly this it does take the time of a practitioner. So I would love to see homeopathic hospitals brought back outpatient clinics where people who can't afford it, you know, sort of like our public bulk billing Mm. um, system here in Australia, I would love to see that um, to get people really to a state of wellness because it benefits us all. If we are all thriving, if we are not anxious, if we are not depressed, if we are not traumatised, it benefits all of us, our population, you know, so that should be where we sort of keep our eyes on the prize, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And so talk us through, um, you know, what an appointment is like. So if you were going to go and book with a homeopath, you know, I have my unique experience, but what should you expect? What does the process look and feel like as the patient? So it really depends first on whether it's an acute issue or a chronic ongoing issue. So If it's an acute issue, let's say acutes are the things that should typically be self-resolving. So a child might come in, it's like they've got a fever, they've got um, a cold, a flu, they've got teething issues, you know, an ear infection. These are acutes. So in that you would be just looking through the Materia Medica and you would be matching up the symptoms of the child with the best fitting homeopathic remedy. So all of our remedies, we've got hundreds, we've got thousands really, but only a hundred that I would use routinely in clinic 
I need to find which one is going to stimulate their body to quickly heal itself. So the remedies aren't always individualized. They're, it's like, for want of yeah. a better word, it's like you, know, you have the array of, of remedies yeah. and then you pick the best ones, but can you mix them like a naturopath would mix? So you will sometimes, and that's what you'll find in a lot of health food stores, you know, say your teething mix, your browers, cold and flu. A lot of people would have heard of the rescue remedy as well. That can be a combination of up to six remedies for like panic attacks Mm -hmm. for anxiety. And so these are combinations. So you would put in the six most effective anxiety remedies, say to try and help somebody. If somebody does come into a clinic though, and you're actually seeing a practitioner, often the practitioner can see what is the number one best fitting remedy. So those general ones are good. If you're going to buy them from the store and you don't have time to see somebody, they're brilliant. If it's somebody, then you're going to match, you know, the best one. But, you know, they tend to be a short list of, you know, say fever remedies. You're really looking at like a handful that are going to be the most effective. Same goes for like an ear infection, et cetera. Where my favorite sort of prescribing is, is the classical chronic prescribing. So this is where somebody will come into me and I'll set aside 90 minutes and we'll be looking at, okay, I'll say, what are you in for today? You know, how can I help you? They'll tell me what their main complaint is. What is the main reason and the main symptoms that you want help with? So we'll get that down. But then we're going to spend the next 90 minutes looking at them as the whole person. So from when you were a child up until now, I need to know all of your physical symptoms. Did you get tonsillitis a lot as a child? Did you get glandular fever in high school? Um, You know, do you get gut issues? Do you have gut sensitivities? You know, X, Y, Z. I want to know everything that you can tell me so that I know what your vital force is doing, what energy in your body, because all of the symptoms are just little clues for where that organism is out of balance. And I need to know that so that I can give you the correct remedy to stimulate you to get back into balance. Because when you use a homeopathic remedy, what you're going to do is you're going to activate the self-healing energy, that divine, intelligent, vital force that flows through you to heal itself. So that's it. It's not the homeopathy healing you. It's that your body does know how to heal itself. Sometimes it just needs like the key in the ignition, get it going. Cause there's a lot of reasons why our vital force and our self-healing mechanism can get weighed down. And so that can be toxins, a toxic overload. The body can't communicate correctly. It can be trauma. Trauma is like a spanner in the, in the works of things. And it can really block that self-healing mechanism And then you've also got your family inheritance, like what energetics come down your family lines. These can be really strong. So let's say your asthma, your eczema, your hay fever, these can be really strong correlations. So you can have a baby born who just automatically has it. And you look through the family medical history and it's like, this is a strong, you know, gene type thing that comes down the family line. So you're looking at all of that. And then on top of all of the physicals, then I really want to know what have your mental and emotional struggles and stresses been throughout life? Because this is really indicative to me of your overall energy. So say, did your parents get a divorce when you were five and it was just awful for you? And, you know, you've been grieving and you've now become a little bit emotionally blocked off, you know, in your heart and it keeps you retreat, you know, retreated and this sort of thing. So looking at that, or um, did you experience sexual abuse at some point in your life? Because these really carry significant emotional, but like the symptoms with women are very similar. When you look and you take a case, you will see the similarities in these cases and then how their body manifests the disease symptoms. So it's very interesting. So what you're really looking for is the patterns of disease that flow through for somebody. And when you take a good case over 90 minutes and you really allow that person to tell you like really honestly where they're stuck, like what, what's been going on for them, then you have a hope to find the best homeopathic remedy. And when they start taking that, they will know and things will come up for them and you'll find that can be Physical things will come up when they start taking it or the mental, emotional things. And it will be that the body is purging this unnecessary weight that it's been carrying throughout a lifetime. And then the vital force is just freed up a little bit and they can start to really heal on that, you know, cellular 
level and symptoms disappear. I love I love that. <laughs> that is such a good explanation. So um, you mentioned before you touched on bark um, flower remedies in terms of rescue remedy. Mm. So I've never actually talked about this publicly before, but I've actually just finished studying bushflower essences just because obviously I'm into vibrational medicine. Mm. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there a difference between a homeopathic remedy and a and a flower essence remedy? I think the the flower essences. Flower assistants do come under homeopathic medicine. I'm not sure what potency. Do you know in your studies what potency they're typically using? No. They might the top be. Of my head. I would have to look that up. I'm really sorry. No, no. They may. Oh, so I don't use them as often, but I know people get great success with mm. them. So they sell them up here in all the health food stores and they really cover I think a lot of the uh, the mental, emotional, you know, the relaxation and all of that. And so um, they may be the lower potencies where there actually is a tiny element um, of that crude dose. Say with my homeopathic dispensary and what I usually send out, these might be, you know, 30C, 200C, 1M. People will often see the, the potency of it. Mm. Now, as we step up, that ladder, it's um, sort of, uh, it's like the energetic component of it becomes stronger, yeah. but the crude doses of them, um, like the 6X, and I think that's even in the, I'm almost positive that the rescue remedy is also along like the 6X, 6C, like the, the lower one. So you get the tiny little element of that crude dose. So yeah, I think, yeah, I you're kind of jogging my memory, my study yeah, memory. Yeah. I don't know how where I have capacity for this in my brain at sometimes, but like, yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's it. So, can you de- describe to us exactly what a homeopathic remedy is? Yeah. So, pretty much, you are going to harness the energy from a substance, whether it's an animal substance, a mineral substance, um, or a plant. Here we go. <laughs> That's okay. So that's where they're derived from. I've always wondered this. So they're derived from plants, animals, and minerals. Yes. Yeah. And so just all natural substances. So let's say uh, the belladonna plant, you will harness like say a little bit from the belladonna, the crude element of it into a tincture, and then you are going to dilute it and succuss it, dilute it and succuss it. And what happens in that process? See, if you were to take like a teaspoon of belladonna, pure belladonna, uh, you would manifest the symptoms quite full on, but it can be quite toxic. Now, what the original homeopath who discovered homeopathy found was that in the process of diluting and succussing, succussing being sort of like extremely shaken, like very volatile shaking, when you succuss it, dilute, succuss it, dilute, the remedy maintains the frequency, the energy of the belladonna plant, and yet the toxic nature of those constituents is lost. So now you have pure healing without the actual toxic substance. So if I was to give you an example of that, when people have gastro, so vomiting and diarrhea, the homeopathic remedy that they go for, the number one effective remedy is called arsenicum album. Now, arsenicum album comes from actually arsenic, the poison. Now, in that, the homeopaths used to experiment with it. So when patients came in with vomiting and diarrhea, if they gave them a tiny little dose of arsenic, it got rid of the vomiting and the diarrhea, but you still had the slightly toxic effects of the arsenic. Now, what they found is that when you dilute, succuss, dilute, succuss, dilute, succuss to the point where you got arsenic amalgam, now you can heal the vomiting and diarrhea, but you have no residual effects of the poison. So therein lies the whole idea of it. So with homeopathy, when you're trying to find the perfect remedy, the idea, the principle of homeopathy is that like cures like. So you want to match your, your symptoms, maybe the vomiting and diarrhea, with the likeness of the remedy, which if you drink arsenic on its own, what do you get? Vomiting and diarrhea. So it cancels out in the energetic sphere. It is when you take the energetic essence of arsenic for vomiting and diarrhea, this is where it cancels out the symptoms within the body. So 
Yeah, that's what you, that you seem to work with women and children about infertility a lot. And I have, I get a lot of clients coming to me, you know, really in a state of anxiety and and fear around their fertility. Can you share with us some of the experiences that you've had with your clients working with their fertility and how you've really been able to, to nurture their bodies through that process? For sure. So these days it's sort of multifaceted. So the pill has been a real mm. stunner in the works for a lot of women. So when we have shut down our reproductive system for, for some people it's decades, for some of us it's a shorter period of years, but we've shut that down and we've stopped ovulation from occurring. And when we stop taking the pill, the residual effects of that shutdown are still active. So we're not releasing the right cascade of hormones. We've not got the right mucus, that cervical egg white mucus. The body's not come back into its perfect balance. And so using homeopathy, we can use remedies to stimulate, you know, the re-energizing of the reproductive system. So remedies like Thuya, remedies like folliculinum, menorinum, these can very quickly reinstate that good hormonal cascade. Then we get the good mucus. And so for many couples, I would say the reason that they're not conceiving is actually just a matter of the mucus is not abundant enough. The sperm cannot swim to the egg because it's so dry and then the sperm just dries out and so we can't conceive. And so for a lot of cases, it's that simple. Then we've got um, some of the deeper rooted sort of hormonal imbalances, whether it's the endometriosis, the PCOS, um, those sorts of pictures now in that, and it's always a personalized prescription. I can't tell people, you know, if they're listening, if I could tell you, yeah. right, if you've got endometriosis, <laughs> go and get this remedy, it'll help. I would, I would so say it, but it's such an individualized reason for some people, the endo comes down their family lines. There's a strong familial inheritance. Um, but in others, you know, it was brought on by, um, you know, sometimes taking the pill or other medical interventions, which cause the hormones to sort of blow up. And then we're looking at this pathology. So we're looking at those sorts of things and homeopathy can be used to just bring that back into balance. Um, if it's severe endometriosis, like if we've got stage four, a lot of my patients will get the surgery to remove that endometrial tissue. And it's in those years following that we really want to get on top of it, enhance fertility so that we can conceive. And we really want to try and prevent the endometriosis, that cycle from continuing. Because you will see some people, they're very young. Uh, it's like stage four. They go in, they get the laparoscopy, they get it all removed. Two years later, it's back. They need to get it removed again. So this is where we're looking at the energetic blueprint and it's this driving force and it's the over-proliferation of tissue. Now it's uh, with homeopathy that we want to try and recalibrate that and stop it from regrowing. We want to stimulate the body enough and remind it that that's not normal. It's not normal to be in overdrive in that sense. When you look at endometriosis, there's often a family history of cancer, which with the body, you can understand that it's a similar mechanism, the over-proliferation of tissue. And it's just, you know, in a tumor, a cancer cell, it's like boom, 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 it keeps growing. In endometriosis, it just keeps growing. There's also the hormonal element of it. So if the parent had breast cancer, the child is much more likely to be prone to endometriosis and stuff like that. So you factor all of this in when you're prescribing to try and recalibrate that energetic field. Um, and then fertility wise, half of the time, nearly now 40% to 50% of the time, it's the men and sperm counts have been dropping at a remarkable rate. So we are looking now, and we have men in our twenties who are not as fertile as our great grandparents were in their fifties. And it's that, uh, toxins in our environment are severely causing a drop in sperm, um, and that can look like many things, you know, whether it's fragrances, heavy metals, um, just external, you know, pollutants, it has a big effect on our sperm counts. Also stress, we're living very much out of harmony with nature. So we're not under the sun very much. The sun is very beneficial for our health um, in absorbing all of that energy from the sun, that electromagnetic radiation. Now we don't want to burn. But good vitamin D levels and exposing our skin to sun is really important. 
then we're working in front of like blue lights. A lot of us work on our computers. We're watching our screens like late into the night. Um, we're completely out of that circadian rhythm. And that really does impact our, our health, our hormone health. Stress, I would say, is probably number one. Um, and it's that our minds are so busy. We are trying to do so much more than our ancestors had to do and and stress about. So back then they had different stresses. It's just that for us in our modern lifestyles, it's almost like the stress doesn't stop. Yeah. And even when people are doing innocent things, like let's say something like Instagram, most people love being on Instagram, right? Because it's fun and it's entertaining, but it can be really overwhelming for the mind. So what, you know, it's just this constant overstimulation. The vagus nerve is like constantly activated. People's gut health is probably, you know, less optimal than ever because we're so busy in our mind. The body and the nervous system isn't reaching a state of true relaxation and regeneration. So people don't sleep as well. People don't rejuvenate as well. We hop ourselves up on coffee to keep going. Our diets, you know, of course, our diets are a bit more inflammatory than they've ever been. And it's this whole, you know, cascade of things. So with the men, when we treat them homeopathically, it's about picking the best remedy again to suit them. And I, um, in some cases, we can get the sperm counts up by four times the amount in six months, which is a massive increase in sperm. Yeah. So, and, and it's it's an all over effect. So I will ask them, you know, get out in the sun every day, reduce your stress, go to bed, um, eat as well as you can, use the homeopathic medicine. There are a couple of great supplements that they can use as well alongside all of this. So it is accumulation of things, but definitely homeopathics alone is very potent. Is, is there, you know, obviously with women and our bodies, there can be a lot of signs when our hormones are off and our reproductive systems are off not always, but often, is it the same for men? Will men know that their sperm count is down? What are, the, are there symptoms? Sometimes, I mean, low sex drive, mm. um, being extremely stressed, being fatigued. Um, but a lot of men will go in for a semen analysis and be truly surprised yeah. um, that their results are so low. When we look at it though, um, they are low across the board. So from 1973, they've done um, research like, and, and this is like a big red flag. Like it's not, oh, sometimes it's on our mainstream news, but rarely, but we have seen a decrease. Oh gosh, what is it? A 40% decrease in sperm count since 1973. Is it 40%? It may, it may even be higher. So they've just released a new data in the last couple of years that's saying it's even more alarming. So what this is actually saying, because men produce so many sperm, right? You know, they produce millions. It's not been the most obvious red flag because there are still a lot of babies being born but the rates of infertility are climbing very quickly. And with the levels, as they continue to plummet, um, it was on the Australian news a year ago, like at some point we will reach zero if we don't turn this around. Um, and they're projecting that in sort of the next 100 years that we are in for like a very much um it's such a steep decline that it is very concerning. Like a handmaid's maid's tale situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, that is yeah. that is, and, and so we don't want to cause people like to completely freak out. But also, I'm very honest about like this is a very serious condition. Mm -hmm. Like we we cannot continue on the trajectory that we are because that is the end of the human race. And um, yeah. when you've got scientists all over the world sort of like screaming this from the, the rooftop and they're wondering why people aren't taking it seriously, um, it really does need a bit more attention. And we need to be really intentional with our kids and this next generation mm -hmm. of keeping them as, as, you know, clean and wholesome as possible, reducing that toxic load, um, the stress levels. And we need to get back in touch with nature and eating wholesomely. It's, it's a whole, you know, it's a whole thing in itself. Oh, for sure. It's kind of nice just as the woman to hear the man side, because obviously we, we are so informed yeah. about all the things that we you know we can or can't do and and everything around that so it's kind of nice to hear that not nice to hear that men are you mm. know declining their rates of fertility but it's it's nice to hear that yeah we're in this together let's go like there's so much we can all do 
Totally. Yeah. It really, it's really equal. I think it used to be a much more female dominated, you know, infertility, mm. but now we've really reached a level where we're pretty much par on par. I, I feel like I could talk to you all day and I don't want to keep you or the listeners all day, but I, I mean, as someone who has, you know, had this medicine before, you've sparked even more curiosity and interest in me. So thank you so much for sharing your passion. Where can we find you? I know you're probably extremely hard to get into, but even just to, um, like, I just love your Instagram, the information that you share there, for example. So where can we find you, potentially work with you? Sure. So the the number one place where I really put out information and stories and I'm teaching is um, Instagram and that's um, that homeopath at that homeopath. And then through my website, www.melissacoops.com, um, people can see if they want to book in for fertility, um, we're only a couple of months booked out in advance. And then with all of the classical things, because usually when I do a podcast, everyone's like, wow, I really want to address like my deep rooted, you know, <laughs> traumas and physical issues and all of that. I have a practitioner who works with me and he's actually the original practitioner, um, the lecturer at my university that I told you about previously, who no was way. like, you'd be a good homeopath. And then here I go on Instagram and it's just blown up so successfully that I have had to pretty much employ him and mm-hmm. say, will you work, you know, with all of these patients that I've got coming through? So um, his name's Peter and his details are on my website too for anybody who wants to book in for a chronic um, deeper rooted consultation, whether that's for their kids or for themselves. Amazing. And your first aid kits, can you quickly touch on those before we end? Yeah, yeah. So these have blown up deluxe in the last couple of years. Um, actually, I've only been doing it for one, uh, just over one year and we are shipping them all over the world. So they go to the Middle East, they go to the UK, they go to the US um, and here in Australia. And what they are is 20 of the most common homeopathic remedies that people can use at home um, to look after those first aid acute conditions. So whether it is mental, and emotional, like grief, anxiety, something like that, we've got the things for colds, flus, coughs, fevers, teething, um, conjunctivitis, ear infections, like really basic, simple things um, that parents can learn to use at home. And these have been phenomenal in terms of parents learning about homeopathy, learning about this whole new system of medicine, And it's so wonderful because they are teaching their children while they use it. So not only do you get to avoid, you know, a lot of the mainstream pharmaceuticals that a lot of people these days are trying to just be less reliant upon, but you're also teaching kids how their body works and how you can really holistically support it. So yeah, they have been wonderful. Oh, love that. And I just, on a complete side note, I just love to see, especially women, going after their passion and being so successful in sharing, as you said at the beginning, their truth, even when it might not be so mainstream. So thank you for being that, that shining light and that inspiration for so many. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on here, by the way. It's been so wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. Check out the show notes for all those links that Melissa talked about and throw any questions out to me or to her. But Melissa, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys.